Hi, it's Colleen and welcome back to my channel. I'm really glad to have you with me today. I just wanted to take a quick minute to say thank you to all of you who have subscribed to my channel over the past year. It's been just over a year since I posted my very first video and I have learned so much about how to make and edit videos since then. It's been a wonderful learning experience for me. It's nice to have comments and feedback from people who are interested in the same things that I'm interested in. So thank you all for coming along on my journey for YouTube as well as some of the projects that I've been making that are new to me. So I have some really wonderful stuff planned for this year, but first I thought I'd make a video about some of my favorite vintage sewing tools. Some of them I don't think they even make them anymore and it kind of makes you wonder why when a tool is really handy why don't they make that anymore I am really glad to have stumbled upon a few things that are just really wonderful and unique as well as things that are really easy to find and you can get them at any thrift store those older vintage items are a great way to save money on your sewing journey and have a little bit of history in your projects today I'm going to walk you through seven vintage sewing notions or tools that I use all the time in my sewing room and I'll let you know the one thing I never use so stick around for that the first category I wanted to share with you are vintage scissors and I almost exclusively use vintage scissors like this look at this giant pair of dressmaker shears isn't that just wonderful it's got a lot of age to it a patina that is wonderful you can just imagine how many dressmakers have used this set of shears over time the nice thing about these older shears is you can definitely have them serviced and sharpened and they are as good as new these will cut you <laughs> They will, they will cut you. So you have to be really careful when you have a really nice set of shears that are freshly sharpened. But I love these, a nice big set. This is another set that my mother-in-law gave me and she used these for many years to make clothes. And back when we first got married and I started becoming interested in sewing, she handed them on to me. So you might be able to see the name Marble engraved in there so we know whose they are. But this is the brand name Wiss and Wiss is a wonderful brand. If you ever find shears that are the brand Wiss, like at a garage sale or a vintage store or a thrift store, pick them up because they're a great investment. They will literally last you a lifetime if you care for them. If I take these to the sharpener, they're more than happy to sharpen and service scissors like this but they will not touch the Fiskars, Ginger, some of those other brands that are really popular that you can buy on Amazon or buy at Joann. They're not worth sharpening. So when they get dull or they become a little wobbly, they won't even touch them at the sharpener. But a good brand like Wiss or a good antique set of shears like this are fantastic. I also have two pairs of Wiss pinking shears. Now it can be hard to find people that will sharpen pinking shears. And I'm lucky to have a company here in St. Louis area that does sharpen them and does a great job with them. But again, the brand matters. So I have two different sizes of pinking shears. This one makes a bigger pink than this one. They're both Wiss. They were both bought secondhand. Anyway, they will not touch pinking shears from other brands or like the modern pinking shears unless you get a good pair from Wiss, which still makes scissors. Anyway, these are fantastic. I, I highly recommend that you invest in some of these older shears and I'll show you just how well they cut. I've, I've recently had all of my scissors sharpened and they are wonderful. Uh, you have seen me use this pair of scissors in my sewing room. They came in a set of sewing supplies from Aldi for four dollars. It was the scissors plus a couple of other little tools and some other little gadgets. I bought them knowing it was a risk but when I got home I was pleasantly surprised with how wonderful these scissors cut. They just really were fantastic. They were super sharp. They feel good in the hand but it didn't take long before they got a nick in them and now they're kind of uh, out of adjustment and when I try to cut they'll they'll sort of slide across the fabric instead of cutting the fabric. So they may have been great for a month, but they did not last and they will not sharpen them at the sharpening place because they're not worth it. The, the quality of the steel is no good and they can't be adjusted the way some of the other ones can. So that's a lesson in even though it may be great at the beginning, it will not last you the same way a quality pair of shears will. And there's no reason to pay a lot of money for them. I bought these at a dollar a pound place here in St. Louis, which is fantastic. It's all for fabric and notions and tools. Everything there is a dollar a pound. These are heavy, so I might have paid a dollar fifty or two dollars for them. I mean, they're really heavy, but they will last me for the rest of my life. My kids will be able to get them sharpened. Their kids will be able to get them sharpened. It is a fantastic pair of scissors. So you don't have to spend a lot to get good quality. You just need to buy vintage. 
Another thing that I've bought used and I use it all the time is my Taylor's ham. You can purchase Taylor's hams of course today. I mean they're they're commonly available but I found this one in an antique store for about ten dollars and it was in pristine unused unstained condition. This is fantastic. It's a great way to save money on something like a Taylor's ham that I think every sewing room needs to have. You know you could certainly go and order a pressing ham on Amazon today but if you're patient and wait you can find good quality vintage items like this for a fraction of the cost of brand new Taylor's hams. And to me, part of the fun of using vintage is the thrill of the hunt. It's looking to see what's going to be next at the thrift store when I go in. I never know what's going to be there and sometimes I find a treasure like this. So this is a Taylor's ham. It's fantastic. It works great and it, it's probably 50 years old. You've seen me use this tool before. It is a Clinton pleat maker and I don't think they make anything like it these days. There are other types of pleating tools, but you have to buy one for every size of pleat. This one is adjustable and I can go all the way from half inch to one and a half inch pleats simply by sliding out this little arm. I don't think they make anything like this anymore. This came to me in a sewing box full of vintage supplies and I use this thing all the time. All the time. I love it, love it, love it. And I'm so glad to have it in my sewing room. So if you spot one of these, Go ahead and pick it up. It's a great tool. This is for marking a hem on a skirt or a dress. I have tried the modern ones that you can set up with some chalk and you squeeze a little squeeze bulb and it squirts out onto your dress wherever it happens to be. Mine never worked well and eventually it just fell apart. It was made out of plastic and I think I probably paid $40 for it, um, but it was just a hot mess. So this one, you can adjust this piece up and down. You slide it up and down the ruler by loosening and tightening this bolt. And then this arm comes down and you set it on the ground or on a stand and have your person stand next to it. And you can put the fabric here and put this bar up and slide a pin or put a mark right through where that is. This thing is great and I have used this way more than I ever used my modern one. And of course it's already lasted many, many years, decades probably. So I can be sure it will last for many more decades for me. So this is a great tool and they don't make them like this anymore. I did a video a while back about ways to mark fabric and in that video I talked a lot about waxed tracing paper. Waxed tracing paper really isn't popular these days. You know the stuff that you buy at Joanne it's kind of like a carbon paper. It's hard to use. It doesn't make a good mark. It gets old and then it won't work at all. So I buy waxed tracing paper whenever I can find it and it comes in different colors and these sheets you know white, blue, red, yellow, orange. They are fantastic. They make a really, really strong mark on the fabric. I think they may not be as removable as some other marking methods, but depending on your purpose, these can be really great. So I do buy them when I find them vintage. And my mother-in-law actually just gave me this package not long ago. It's completely unused. So it's really fantastic to get brand new sheets of wax tracing paper. And even if you find them that have been used before, they last forever. These are easily 50 years old, um, if not more. And I prefer these over every other type of tracing paper. So waxed paper is the way to go and you can find them in vintage packages like this. But as much as I love wax tracing paper, I have recently found another vintage tool that I actually prefer for marking fabric. And it is this little gadget. So I'll show you this up close, but essentially it is a little chalk tool that has a pin and you can place the pin with chalk around it through on one side. And then you put the other piece with chalk on it over the pin. They slide together like that and you can mark both sides of your fabric at once. Fabulous. It works wonderfully. And I don't know why they ever moved away from this because that's really the hassle, right? It's how do you mark both sides of your fabric at one time? It's hard. And so people do thread tracing, they do tailor's tacks, they'll have to do the wax paper or the carbon paper. And then sometimes you have to mark each piece individually. It can take a lot of time and energy to transfer those pattern markings from the pattern to the fabric. This thing is fabulous. It works so, so well. If you ever spot a case like this, uh, and I've actually got a couple of them now, I've been able to find them, grab it because it's really fantastic. This is another thing that my mother-in-law gave me and I think, oh, 
how brilliant is it? It's Taylor's chalk with a built-in sharpener. As you use it, it gets dull the way a pencil gets dull. This lets you sharpen it. You just drag it across like this and it creates a nice sharp edge on your Taylor's chalk. Brilliant. Why'd they go away from doing this? I have no idea. This is a, such a wonderful, helpful tool to have. So long after I use up this chalk, I'm going to hang on to the top lid because of that sharpener. Tracing wheels. The ones that you can get today have a plastic handle and a real thin kind of wobbly little disc with teeth on it. They're flimsy. They don't feel great in the hand. They work. They work just fine, but they don't feel great in the hand. Something like this is far more substantial and it just feels good when you're using it. This was my grandma's, but I have seen these with the better handle. Sometimes they're with wood handles. You know, the older ones are just lovely, lovely to work with. Um, they do a great job and they hold up a lot better than their modern plastic counterparts. Here's a darning egg. And I recently used this to repair a sweater and it is so great to have. It's just one of those things that you don't think about needing until you have a favorite sweater that gets a hole in it. And most people will just put that in the trash. They'll think, oh, it's worn out. I can't use it anymore. But you can actually darn your sweaters just like they did back in the old days. And a darning egg is fabulous for that because it allows you to stretch the fabric over the egg and then you can see where the stitches are so that you can pick them up with your needle and thread. So I actually have a couple of these but I do pull them out on a pretty regular basis and again they're easy to find at a thrift store or antique store usually for not very much money. What I have found is that most of the time I can buy vintage cheaper than I can buy new. Uh, I can buy antique sometimes cheaper than I can buy new. And a lot of times people don't want this kind of stuff because not very many people sew anymore. Uh, it's kind of a, a niche hobby. <laughs> and so there's a lot of these things out in the marketplace, but not as many people to buy them. They just don't go for very much money, uh, which is great for people like us because we can pick them up really inexpensively and add them to our collection and give them a new life. Another category of items is vintage trim. So I've been building my collection of vintage dead stock. Dead stock is materials or items that are brand new, never been used, still with their original packaging. That's dead stock. And I have recently been able to find a lot of vintage and antique dead stock laces and trims and things like this Sutash braid. I've got a giant roll of it. I bought it from a dollar a pound place. I actually have several colors and rolls as big as this, which is really great. Otherwise you're buying a package of just three or four yards at the fabric store. And if you're doing historical costuming, particularly in the late Victorian era, you need a lot of this if you're gonna recreate some of those beautiful Victorian patterns. So it's a great way to buy it is on a spool like this for pennies compared to buying it new. I have a lot of laces. I recently found some hand beaded trim pieces that look like little buckles that are probably from the 1920s for, you know, again, less than a dollar a piece. And I can't wait to make the make a costume and put those on there. I can't buy new of the same thing for anywhere near that cost today. And the last category of items I want to talk about is vintage notions. If you sew clothes, you know that the fabric can be a pretty significant expense, but oftentimes you can pay just as much, if not more, for all of the notions that you need to complete your project. So the hooks, the eyes, the binding, the piping, the zippers, the buttons, all of those things can really add up when you're buying them new. A way to save money is to buy them second hand. I have completely stocked my sewing room with vintage and thrifted notions. My button collection cost me virtually nothing. My zipper collection, virtually nothing. I mean, I'm really buying things for a fraction, a fraction of the cost that would take me to buy them new. And often I can find really great antiques. These are hooks and eyes that are probably a hundred years old. Um, so I was looking up the labeling and it's from the twenties. I can still use those hooks and eyes today. There's nothing wrong with them. Same thing with these buttons. These are antique French crystal buttons and I will be happy to use them someday on one of my projects. They didn't cost me much at all and they're just beautiful. I recently purchased a set of small metal buttons. I think there are 17 in here and they were 99 cents at the antique store, but they are perfect Victorian buttons. Perfect. They're absolutely pristine condition 
beautiful, beautiful buttons. I couldn't buy 17 metal buttons at Joanne for 99 cents. There's no way. But buying thrift and vintage and antique, that's how you get really great stuff for a song. I especially like to find vintage needle books that still have needles inside because these needles have not been used more than likely. This one in particular still has the needle threader. It has several of the needles that don't look like they've ever been removed from their spot. And so those are needles I can use very well today. They're sharp, they're fresh, they're new, they're not bent. I, they're, they have a lot of useful life left in them and they come in these really great vintage advertising sleeves. Okay, I told you I would come back to the one thing that I do not use vintage and that is thread. You cannot use old thread in your projects. Often if it's on those really cool wooden spools, it is so old that it will just break with the slightest tug. And I'll show you some examples. They're wonderful to look at. And I do have a jar full of them as decor in my sewing room. I love them. I love the history and I love the old wooden spools, but I never ever sew with that thread. It is just too old, too weak, and it will not hold up from the strain of something, particularly something you're going to wear. Maybe if you were using it as a decorative thread touch on something, maybe, but it will not hold up to the strain of a seam in clothing that you're planning to wear. If you find a big pile of thread at the thrift store, make sure you go through the entire pile and tug on those threads. And if they snap, you cannot use that thread. It will break in your machine. It will break when you sew it. It will break when you wear it. And it's just not worth the hassle. So that is the one vintage thing that I never ever use. So thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate that you watch these videos. I appreciate it when you like and you comment. It just brings me a tremendous amount of joy. It's part of why I wanted to start a YouTube channel. It's because I needed more out of my hobby. I wanted to share it with people and it's hard to find people who can appreciate or enjoy talking about these things as much as other sewists do. And particularly during the pandemic, we're all a little isolated. So it was kind of a fun project. And I thought even if nobody ever watches the video, I'll do it for me. And here we are a year later with, as of today, almost 900 subscribers. I'm blown away. I'm truly, truly blown away by the response to my little channel, my little corner of YouTube. So thank you very much for watching. You can also follow me on Instagram where I post updates between videos. I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks again and have a great day.